Welcome to the Multifamily Deal Lab Podcast, where we dissect the deal before your eyes and ears so you can discover the strategies and tactics that got each deal to the finish line. Strategies and tactics that you can put in your own toolbox to get you to the closing table. From sourcing the deal, raising, due diligence to the property takeover, Multifamily Deal Lab shows how you too can get the deal done. And now here's your host, David Lindahl. Everybody, welcome to Multifamily Deal Lab. I'm your host, Dave Lindahl. This is Brian Darcy, and we're going to take you step by step through what Brian did to get to where he's where he's gotten. This is a, a special uh, interview for me because Brian's my surfing partner. Uh, <laughs> usually, when I go to San Diego, he pulls up in the morning. You know, when we do, we used to do events out there. He pull up in the morning with his van and a wetsuit and a board, and we go off somewhere. Yeah. Surf. The whole crew sometimes. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Bring different people, people that couldn't get beyond the waves, beyond the whitewater. But so how's things? How you been? Haven't seen you in a while. Pretty good. I mean, this has been a, a weird time for sure with all the uh, stay-at-home stuff going on and the impact we've had to our current properties. Some it's been bad, some it's been good. You know, it's kind of the way things are, right? Yeah, I think. Uh, so how many properties do you have right now? Six buildings and six multifamily and four commercial. All right. Uh, how, about, how are your commercials doing? Commercials doing pretty good, actually. They're kind of small, and so a lot of small businesses run out of them. At first, it was a little rough, and then um, everybody kind of came back quickly. And this was in, these are in South Carolina, so it was one of the early states that opened up. So we did okay. Were they businesses that dealt with the, the general public or? Uh, you know, some are like nail salons and oh, yeah. massage kind of places, those took a bigger hit. You know, it's interesting, Our big one of our biggest tenants is Hertz at one of our buildings. Mm. And Hertz, gosh, I don't think we are one week into this whole thing. Hertz writes us a letter and said, we're, just as to inform you, we're not going to pay rent for the next six months. <laughs> and I'm like, it's the biggest company out there that we have. The rest is all these small-time companies. Yeah. So, I just saw something on news on Hertz on you know how many offices, uh, how many different locations they closed, which was quite a few. Yeah, they're actually you know they're back up and going. So it was only about a two month hit, but it was just interesting that they just you know pulled the plug on us. And I'm like, they're the big guys. We're these little little operators. So it was just an interesting thing. And your multifamilies, were you seeing your biggest difficulties in your in your C properties or? Yeah, the C the C properties uh, that were. Uh, kind of struggling anyway so some of the tenant base there was uh already kind of struggling you know we had a little bit higher delinquency so the the two properties that i had that were a little bit higher delinquency they got hit bad you know and even though the management was trying to walk people through getting unemployment and getting applying for the aid and all that we were hoping that as they applied for that they would uh they would pay their rent so uh, those are seeing a lot higher delinquency. But I had uh, one property, and I think you know about the, the one out in Texarkana with Rob and Eric. That did exceptionally well. So it was just interesting. It was really down to what the management company was doing and the tenants that they had present because we stayed at a, a solid 90-plus percent on two properties there, and it was a very strong management company. And the, it was almost a, you know barely a speed bump, like I said. And all of these are in Texas and C-Class. Why don't you tell everybody how you got started um, so they sure. get an idea of uh, who you are and what you do? All right. Well, <laughs> I worked in software and systems. I was a corporate executive at a large medical device company here. And uh, I had a part of my division was in London. I had to go to England area quite, you know, about once a quarter. That's not so bad. It's not so bad. This was back in 2008, maybe, and I was about to jump on a plane, and, and you know, this is before batteries lasted long, and there were actually plug-ins on airplanes, right? So I'm like, I got to get a book. And so I kind of went through my bookshelf and pulled off the shelf uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, somebody had given to me ages before. So by the time I landed, I'd, I'd read the whole book, and I'd landed in London, and I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm doing everything wrong. And up to that point, I thought I was doing everything right. You know, I was uh, my degree in engineering. I moved up in management and senior management and corporate executive. My parking spot was next to the CEO of the company, you know, my assigned parking spot. And so I really thought I was doing things right. And that just kind of opened up my eyes to 
there's a better way than a W-2, than active income, and that's passive income. So I went down that path and started flipping homes, not very many, and uh, down that path of going to flip homes. And, and about that time, I went to a seminar in Florida. So in 2009-ish, went to a seminar in, in Orlando, and you were there. <laughs> and you were giving, it was the oh, yeah. it was the pitch fest, right? So, but apartment house riches or multifamily boot camp or whatever it's called now uh, was talked about. And it made 10 times more sense to me than flipping homes. And so we signed up. And from that point on, we uh, got into coaching and got into the L Society and all of that, which we now call the master's program. And that that's what kind of you know, shifted for me and we began buying multifamilies. And, but getting out of that engineering mindset was a hard, a hard thing. And it really took a lot of mindset set change. And I think, uh, you know, because I was, I was so risk adverse, I actually ran the risk management board for this large medical device company. So I was super risk averse. And the way I kind of got out of that was kind of doing it myself and investing in my own, we're using my IRA to begin the self-directed IRA investing and begin that process so I could, like, in a sense, prove to myself that I could do it and then um, begin to begin to syndicate. Let's dissect that first deal. By the way, so are you out there surfing every morning still? Uh, I've been off for a couple of weeks. My neck is uh, pretty messed up. But what this happened? year, I have a bulging disc in my neck, so acts up, flares up every once in a while. And but this year, since the beaches opened up, so yeah. they're closed for a little bit, and then the beaches opened up. I surfed every day for a solid month. But I've been off for about two weeks, and we just had a huge swell come through, like eight feet and uh, six to eight feet. And I didn't go out any day, any of those days. It was hard to not go. But have you um, read that book, Mind Over Back Pain? I have. I love that book. So yeah. So what? Uh... Yeah, what's so stressing me on those pages, right now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you should, have you read any? So what we're, what we're talking about is uh, I had severe back pain for two years, and I had two bulging discs, or uh, still do, two bulging discs, three degenerated discs, and then the top of my spine looks like um, coat rack because, uh, you know, the spurs everywhere. And uh, as you know, I was freaking like, my brain stopped talking to my calf, and I was dragging my right leg around for about a year and a half and all that. And I read that book, Mind Over Back Pain, and uh, somebody handed it to me and said, hey, you know, if you can, after I tried thousands of things, and I was teaching, you know, uh, on a regular basis back then, people could see I was in pain, and they'd offer me all kinds of remedies, and I tried them all. So somebody handed me this book, Mind Over Back Pain, and said, hey, if you, if you think this book was written for you, you know, as you're reading through it, then, you know, read his other books. And I read through it, and I was like, holy crap, I mean, he must have been, he could have been in my, you know, looking over my shoulder when he wrote this book. But anyways, um, I read his other books, and then I wrote. Um, have you uh, read this book, Unlearn Your Pain? No, it's a really I think good book. I need one. to go read it right now. <laughs> Unlearn Your Pain is a really good book, and it. Um, and this is for everybody out there that's in any kind of pain, back pain. You have problems with your wrist, topical chondral syndrome. You have fibromyalgia. The stuff you know, it's called the mind body syndrome. So, anyways, uh, Unlearn Your Pain is a book about, you know, how to unlearn your pain. And it's got all kinds of exercises in it, which I follow because I would, I would do anything to get out of that pain. It was so bad. I couldn't sleep at night, you know? So when you're sleeping like a three, half hours each night, you know, you, you mentally get screwed up. The thing that saved me was I went out to this website, um, TMS Wiki, TMS, if you're writing this down, TMS, Tom, Mary, Sam, wiki.com. And um, on the left-hand side, it's called uh, Structured Learning. So don't on the left hand column, there's a bunch of things and the, one of them is called therapy. Don't click on the therapy, click on the structured learning and it's a 40 day writing program. And it tells you, you know, what to write about and, and it has all these different things in there. And by the time you get to the 40 days, you should, should be out of pain. Some people are out of pain right after they read the book. Some people wow. are out of pain, um, you know, one weekend, two weeks in, I actually was a hard healer. Like, you know, they, they phrased me as a hard healer. It took me 60 days to be finally out of pain, but the whole thing is, you know, Big psychological thing. But anyway. Hey, that book again, Dave. What is the name of it again? Uh, one of them was Relearn Your Pain. I mean, yeah. Unlearn Your Pain. Unlearn. Yeah, Unlearn Your Pain. And then the other one was uh, TMS Wiki website, Structured Learning. And if you just follow that every day and you write, it takes about half an hour a day to write it, but you follow it every day, you get so much crap out of, out of the subconscious of your mind. You know, it's just a great cleaning process anyways. 
That's cool. So as we digress, but I know everybody, you know, a lot of people have <laughs> chronic pain, you know, so this, it certainly helped me and it's helped a lot of people that I've turned this book on to and, and then the, that website. So, uh, you know, it could possibly help you as well and keep, keep you out there surfing. Yeah. All right. So let's dissect your first deal, uh, going into your first deal. So what was your very first deal coming out of uh, the learning process of multifamily? You know, we started down the path and sometime in 2009, taking the uh, RE Mentor seminars and everything and kind of going down that path. And it wasn't until actually 2011 that things kind of heated up and we bought, we had a 120 unit that we were putting under contract and moving forward. And then the same seller also had a 90 unit and it was mm-hmm. in Midland, Midland, Texas. Yep. And so we ended up buying that portfolio from that seller. And How did you it, find the seller for the first deal? We had found originally, uh, we had bid on the deal probably eight or nine months earlier. Through a broker? We, through a broker. We went all the way down through best and final. And we literally lost out on the deal for under $50,000. Okay. And so we thought for sure that would have happened. So that would have been the beginning of. Uh, 2011, but turns out it came back around. Of course, a lot of these deals do. We got contacted, and uh, then we bid again, and we got the deal at a cheaper price because now the seller had to hold on to it a lot longer. So it was around. Uh, gosh, it was so cheap that back then it was you know 24 a door kind of thing. Sweet. Well, that was a great time to be buying. Just just like this next opportunity is going to be great. Yeah, That's 11 and a half cap. cap. <laughs> you know, it's just what, great. What cap? Eleven, 11 and, a and a half cap. Wow. You know, just crazy, crazy acquisition. And that was really the gold standard deal. That that was uh you know, we spent three million for that hundred and twenty five unit or hundred and twenty unit and then another uh I wanna say one point two million for the ninety unit that came along with it. The ninety unit was a little bit older, but it was they were still both full already. So we, we uh, took those on, and uh, within three years, really two and a half years, we sold the 90 for about a $2.5 million profit, and uh, we ended up selling the 120 after we refinanced it. So we refinanced it, and for a $2 million, ref- uh, we pulled out $2 million on the refi because so we wow. paid everybody back that invested in the deal. And then uh, we held it for a little bit longer and then sold it for a couple million more. That was like the best deal ever as well. So um, we at one time we were cranking out cash flow of uh, over 18% to the investors. So that was uh, that was a really good deal. We raised the rents $450 in the first two years. Wow. And that was because oil was booming in that region. And You know, interesting, when we did refi that deal, we went over the cliff on – uh, seller's market too, when oil market dropped out and uh, we were able to sustain, we went into cash management for a little bit with the lender. So there was about a year of no cash flow. And then it kind of just slowly started moving it back up and started cash flowing again. And then we uh, ended up turning around and selling that for a couple million more. So that was a overall good. But during that, if you were asking me in that middle, when we actually went over the seller's market too, yeah. and um, that was a, that was a rough year. That was, uh, you know, when the oil market crashes, it's not something that you can come right out and predict, you know? Yeah, 2015, the end of 2015, right in that range is where it really got bad. And uh, we saw it coming, but we had already done the refi. We saw it coming in that in that region. They do all those, they pull all the oil permits, you know, and that sells it's a healthy oil market. Yeah. And the number of permits, weekly permits, was declining rapidly. So it was around 300 and it was going down to under 100. And uh, had a, a real good gentleman on our team. He's just a great statistician. And so uh, he was watching these data, but we had already done the refi. So we were pretty much, we needed to go for the ride. <laughs> yeah. <And> we did. <laughs> but it was a good ride overall because we came back. Yeah. Good That's the good thing about real estate. You buy a good property in a good area and, uh, you know, it tends to come back over time. Time heals most wounds in real yeah. estate. So how did you raise the funds for that first deal? Did you, so that was a, bro, so it was, a, it was a broker contact that got you into the best and final? Yeah. And then as an, the same broker came back six or eight months later, and that's when we put it under contract. And I'd, I'd been actually communicating a lot with that seller and uh, met him once out in Texas. So 
because he had another property that we were also potentially interested in. And uh, then we put in a contract and then raising the money, uh, we had several people. Hold on a second. I want to go back to the broker. Um, you didn't get this deal with the broker and then you kept, did you keep following up with the broker? Did you continue the relationship with the broker or did he just come back around? And, we had a and continued relationship with him and we had the backup, you know, the backup offer in, right? Yep. And we continued the relationship with him. But when they fell out of contract, he didn't call us. If somebody, one of the people on our team had actually was talking to him about another deal and he's like, oh yeah, you guys were bidding on that Midland prop or that those Midland properties. Are you guys interested in them again? And so that's kind of how it came back. So mm -hmm. it was, uh, we kind of, uh, a little bit gave up, you know, so we probably followed up with him for the first three months and then nothing happened. And then in a, just a sidebar conversation with him, he brought it back up and then it, we ended up capturing that deal. Interesting. So it's, in, you know, it's important to keep up those contacts. That's for sure. Yeah. That was uh, that was the point I was going to get to, and also um, you had met with the buyer. How did that happen? I mean, the seller. Uh, the seller. Um, I got on the phone with him one time, and he was a great guy. It reminded me of my. I have family in Texas, and so the way that they'd say my name, Brian. You know, so he was a, a great. <laughs> I just really <laughs> liked him, so we kind of hit it off on the phone, and then I think we went out to El Paso. Me and one of my partners went to El Paso and we met him at his property there. We didn't do that deal, yeah. but it was just kind of cool to, to meet the seller. Yeah. I mean, any, any opportunity you have to meet a seller, you know, it's a great opportunity because you meet him face to face and damn, they remember you. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. They do, you know, they, they push things your way, which is good. Surprisingly, it's a small world. Uh, we do know a few other sellers, especially in San Antonio area. We were attempting to buy a property with a seller one time and um, it didn't go through. And then we ended up buying one of his other properties later, you know, a couple, probably about two years later. So it's interesting how we get deals, not just through brokers, but if you can make a contact with somebody that's an active owner, sometimes they'll, they'll call you back when it, it comes down to, oh, we want to sell this. Oh, those guys were very interested or I like them or we... You know, and you hit it off with them in some way, shape, or form. That's it. Personality, personality, commonality. All right, let's talk about the money raise. So the How money raise. How much? Uh, we need to raise one point two on the larger property and eight hundred thousand on the small property. Uh, the loan was local because there was no Fannie Mae there, uh, so we we were getting a, a local lender or basically a conduit lender there, and. Those uh, loan to value didn't work out so great, so we had to raise 1.2 on the first deal, and then we had to raise uh, 875 on the or 800 on the second deal, and that was some. That also included about 400,000 of capex or capital repairs reserve that we wanted to do some facelift on both of those properties, and so we end up finding a single investor for the 90 unit. And they wow. brought all the funds. How did that um, happen? That's everybody's uh, dream. It was through raising the money for the other. You know, we had a, a big chunk, two million to raise. Yep. And as we were creating relationships in that, uh, we found somebody that had just made a, a huge sale of, of, of an assisted living property and they wanted all of it. So basically they took a little bit larger percentage, obviously, but it was still a good deal for them and for us. And then on the raise side, there were uh, six partners in this, and so on the raise, we all, okay, we're all going to raise money, and it all worked out, you know, where we, we thought we were each going to raise an equal amount, and that, that didn't work out that way. Yeah, um, not usually. <laughs> it doesn't usually work out that way, just FYI. So in it ended up, I, I pretty much ended up raising about a million of the 1.2. I think it was 900 of the 1.2. And it was going, so the first month of the contract was like hell. Because I'm like, oh my God, we got to raise this money. It's just It was a mountain. It was Mount Everest, you know? And I remember, this is way back in 2011, and I think you were out here for some sort of a leadership, like an L Society thing, and it was at La Jolla. And I remember going there just like head down because I couldn't raise any money. And we were about a month away from closing. We hadn't raised a dime yet. And... I don't know. It's just in that conference or whatever. I may, I walked out of there, you know, why not me? And something might've been said there was like, well, I have a great deal 
and this is a great investment and we, we're giving a great return, why would somebody not invest with me? And I think up to that point, I still had my engineering mind, that analytic mindset that was saying, why would somebody invest with me? I know nothing about real estate. You know, I'm that mind chatter is what I was yeah. living to. And I, I just read a quote this morning, actually, uh, Ford said it. He said, if you believe or if you don't believe, either one's going to come true. You're right. Yeah. Believe yeah. in yourself or if you You're don't right. believe in yourself, it's going to come true. So yeah. at that, up, to, up to that point, I didn't believe in myself. And there was some shift in that that time. And I just started mm -hmm. going, okay, why not us? We could do this. And uh, all of a sudden, things just started opening up. And uh, I think around that same time, another interesting thing, you said, hey, let's surf some more. I got this commercial multifamily going on, and why don't you, we'll surf this morning, you can come to the commercial multifamily, or the commercial academy with me. And I'm like, okay. So I went there. Remember when you had your rose raspberry on your forehead? <laughs> From the, in the sandbar? <laughs> yeah, hitting the sand. <laughs> well, yeah, so, so everybody knows when we surf into a new, I was like, right, take me to a new place surfing. He's like, okay, so uh, we got, I don't forget where it was, but uh, I, yeah, just, you know, I used to get off the board. I just dive, you know, when it's time to, you know, the, the ride was over, I just dive in. Well, I didn't know there were sandbars out there, and I dove right into a sandbar. <laughs> I had to teach so, all day, blood coming down, because it was like, it was a raspberry, you know, it wasn't just a deep cut. It was like cut all over my face. <laughs> yeah, you're standing up there with a raspberry on your forehead. You need an explanation for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. so I came up and gave the explanation. And <laughs> in that conference, I met a bunch of people. And uh, one of the people, they were real timid, and uh, they asked me if I if I would meet with them afterwards, and and I was like, man, I got to get home, you know. And I was like, okay, I'll do it. And so I hung out and met with them afterwards, and they ended up investing half of that investment. Wow. Uh, so they came in with a big chunk, and that was just an opening. And then there was a couple hundred thousand. That was our minimum. So then a couple uh, investors I brought in from work and some other people that I knew from my career at the time, and. And that, that was kind of how but it opened, but truly it only opened because I believed that it could happen. And I think that is such a big part of it. And it, it's probably the biggest thing and probably the most important thing to be a multifamily investor is raising money. It, it's not about broker. It is about broker contacts. And it is about finding deals and, you know, but it is really about making those connections to raise money. So. It's also about it's also about positioning too because you know you, you had the mindset shift but you also you're out there you know you came to that event you didn't have to go to that event you came to that event you know you talked to those people you know when sure. you thought oh I'd rather be driving home you came to the L Society meeting that we had so it's getting yourself out there and just you know being in the right place uh, you know a lot of times it's just it's like what Woody Allen says is timing. You know, being in the sure. right place at the right time and, and, and things happen. It's funny you said the, the why not me, because that was a big part in my life too. My family, we grew up uh, middle class and my father was very frugal. My mother was always in the mindset that other people have the good stuff and, you know, and we, you know, we, we, we get by because she always got by in her life. And, and uh, that's just the way it was, you know, and, and you dreamed about what other people had or you dreamed about these things. And I just remember like in my before, about a year before I started real estate investing, I was like, well, why not me? You know, why does everybody else get all these things? Why can't I have it? And uh, that's when I started reading all those books, you know, The Magic of Thinking Big, Raise the Bar, Awaken the Giant Within. Yeah, great and then it was Instead of why not me, it's like, it's going to be me. You know, so I had decided that it was going to happen. And that's what I find in all successful people. They just make that decision that it's going to happen, regardless of how many times you get knocked down, beat up, how many obstacles come in your way. It's okay. It's going to happen. So Yeah, I, I, I think that that persistence, you know, in belief is there because you could go back and forth in that. But I still think if you're still like failing forward, you know, that, that saying, but you just keep going. If you just keep going, then all of a sudden things start to open up. And I, I have to say, and you you'd mentioned – showing up, you know, my wife and I were showing up to every event that we could. But shoot, we were flying places to go to events, but there were a lot more events in Southern Cal, so we would go to every Southern Cal event just to make contacts. I was also connected to my local RIA, again, just to make contacts. And the more, it's not like, especially out of the RIA, I don't know if I ever pulled an investor out of the RIA, but it was more about me being able to communicate and tell my own story and it was like a constant practice. So I became used to. Yeah. 
that. And then people align with you, not necessarily, you know, the deal is one thing. But uh, a friend of mine, George Anton, said, the currency in our business is not money, it's trust. And so when people see you and they trust you, then you open up the door for them to align with you and invest with you. Yeah, George is a great guy. Yeah, one of my favorite people out there. Of course, yeah, I've never been surfing with him, Dave. <laughs> you, 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 do, you surf, do you surf with him? Is that what you said? No, oh, I said I've never been surfing with him. Oh, yeah, I can imagine George surfing. <laughs> I was going to be, really, George surfs? <laughs> Um, so, um, with meetup now, you know, now we're in the coronavirus crisis, but you can still do, there's a lot of different meetup groups going on virtually. Uh, but still with meetup groups, you get to practice on a regular basis, which is good. You know, you don't have to wait till the monthly meetings of certain things. There's so many different meetups that you can just go. It doesn't have to be real estate or investment related. It just has to be people, people yeah. there that are going to ask you one simple question. What do you do? It's like, boom, I love that game. question. Favorite yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's, and it's funny you say, you know, for some reason we tended to have a lot of events in Southern California. Well, at one point, you know, I'd been teaching since 2002 and buying all those units all around the country. And um, by 2011, 2012, I was burnt out of traveling. Like, I didn't want to go anywhere. So I told the staff that we're going to have events in Boston and San Diego because those are the only two places I want to be. Sometimes <laughs> live, we can't get the hotels in San Diego. But that's it. I just want to be in those two places. And that's why we're out in Southern California all the time. That's how I get to, you know, learn how to surf from you and, and spend all the time on the water. It was great. Cool. Um, so let's talk about uh, surprises. Surprises during the due diligence process. There's always uh, or surprises during the deal prior to owning the deal because there's always surprises after owning the deal as well. So what was some of the yeah, surprises I mean, during due diligence? Due diligence surprises usually come up um, – Depends on who you have doing due diligence. I feel like sometimes people look at a property and they get excited about what they got. And then when you're excited, you tend to overlook the issues. And, you know, significant yeah. surprises come in by way of uh, having to spend a bunch of money on new boilers or new money on these are expensive, big ticket items, right? Boilers, roof leaking didn't get on that roof and then that turns out the one that needed to be replaced for you know hundred thousand dollars and uh, mm -hmm. if you don't know those things it's really hard to manage through after the fact so if you've already raised your money closed your deal and you find out you need a hundred thousand dollars to replace a roof because you've already fixed it eight times for several thousand each time you know yeah. it's really hard and it's hard message to your investors to say hey you know what we got to withhold the cash flow so that we can build up enough capital so we can replace this roof. It's not a good message. So during due mm -hmm. diligence, you know, I would say be a hair splitter and really get to know, go there yourself. Uh, that's one thing that's been one of my mistakes is, you know, one of my biggest problem deals. I didn't go there. Uh, I had a local team, you know, a trustworthy local team, but I felt like it's important for me to, I'm the money raiser and eventually the asset manager type person, then I really want to know what's going on with that property. Cause I don't want to find out later. Oh, we have eight ACs to buy at 3000 or two 2,500 a piece. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's just, it just kills us. And also every surprise, because remember I said money is not our currency, but trust is our currency. Every surprise you have, you're actually taking a withdrawal out of your trust bank account. And uh, if I have to, you know, oh, we got a surprise, we have this issue that we didn't catch during due diligence, that's a little bit of a, to your investor, that's a little bit of a downer. Like, why didn't you guys catch this first? You know, there's that little question. And that is a little bit of an erosion in the trust account, if you will. So I think it's really important that you get there, you get your hands dirty, you get sweaty and dirty. If it's Texas, it's you know, doing due diligence, it's hot there in the, especially yeah. in the summer and you're, you're exhausted and you drink a gallon of water all, you know, and it's just, you're sweating to death as you're going through every single unit. And, and there's uh, always the, you know, if it's a larger complex, there's always one unit that's the hoarder and uh, there's yeah. always one unit that's the cat person. You can't get in there <laughs> or the maintenance, you know, you and never listen to what the maintenance guys tell you. They'll say, Oh, no, I was just in that unit uh, just yesterday. So I said, well, oh, go ahead and open it up anyway. It's vacant. It, it's about ready to be rented. I'm like, well, go ahead and open it up anyway. We walk in. The lights didn't work. 
And I'm like, well, it smells it smells damp in here. And I turn on my light and I look at and and that's about when we started walking through the, you know, oh, yeah. three quarters of an inch of water on the carpet, you know, in there. And you're like, and he's like, no, seriously, I was just in here yesterday. He's probably in there two weeks ago. You know, <laughs> so you don't want to listen to what the maintenance guys. You just got to go verify. It. Get on every roof, not just two. If there's twelve roofs, get on all twelve. Yeah, and I think it's important to understand people's motivations, you know, at different times of the deal. And during the due diligence process, you've got a property management company that wants to get that deal. So if they're doing part of the due diligence, they may oversee some stuff to get that deal done or, you know, may not uh, focus on certain things to, to, to get that deal done. Um, you also can look at your team members, too. So if you're going into a partnership uh, with people that you know or don't know, especially the ones that you don't really know, you kind of know, them, but you don't. You get good feel for them. So that's why they're partners in the deal. But there's that motivation to close the deal for the acquisition fee. And people will rationalize why, you know, this deal can be done because, you know, they're already spending that acquisition fee. So they want this deal done now, not even thinking about the consequences of the things that get overlooked or the things that, you know, are wrong with the property going into the closing. Yeah, that's a that's a huge one because we're talking about just acquisition. You got to understand acquisition is, you know, three to four months, but you're going to hold that property three to five years. And you got to be able to continue to manage that asset, not manage the property, but manage the asset to a profitable place. And if you go into it with that mentality, I'm just getting that acquisition fee, you know, a high percentage of the time, you're going to, it's going to be a rough three to five year hold <laughs> until you could resell. It's like a boat owner. The best day is when you buy it and the, and when you sell the best two days when oh, you I buy it and you sell it. And that's not what you buy a property for. You buy a no. property for passive income. I mean, really, that's what it comes down to. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, you, um, I was about to say something, but if you um, triggered something in my mind about the boat. I bought a, I went out fishing a few years ago with um, some friends. We did all day friends from high school I hadn't seen in a long time. We had such a great time. The next week, I buy a fishing boat, thinking I'm going to go out with friends every weekend. You know, <laughs> the first day I bought it and I took it off the dock. You know, we went to pick it up. The engine stalled. <laughs> and like the, the guy that sold it to me already left and I'm halfway out the harbor and I find a little pier to hook up to and I call him. I was like, hey, I can't th get this boat going. I should have known then to give it back. He's like, I don't understand, you know, pass the engineering report. I don't know what's wrong with it. You know, do this, do that. And, you know, I eventually got it going again. And then I took it a couple of miles down and, and docked it uh, to where my slip was. Uh, but I had problems with that boat the entire time that I owned it. I owned it for one year and then finally I was just like, I'm selling this freaking thing. Because every time I took it out, that engine would that engine would stall. If you're a boat owner that and had a slip, that engine would stall just as I entered the slip or was about to get close to entering the slip. And that's where you know you got Terrible. the wind coming against you, you have yeah. the current coming against you, and you need that little bit of power. Yeah, you need reverse. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, so I didn't even get the joy of owning it the first day, you know, because I had problems. It was a telltale sign. I should have given it back. But that's not what we buy properties for. I mean, yeah, we make a good money, you know, three to five percent. Uh, I usually try to do four percent on the acquisition fee, and um, if the deal works, you know, I try to keep it at four. But you make a lot of money at the beginning, and because the market is so good, you make a lot of money at the end. But if you're not making money during the hold, man, it's a stressful time. And I know this because I've had a property exactly like this. It was great at the buy. And we sold it for a great price. We made a ton of money, but we made nothing from the buy to the sell throughout the whole hold period. It was just nothing but a bunch of problems that deal. Bunch of stress. Yeah, a ton of stress. Yeah, I've had I've had my fair share of those as well. Anybody that's been investing for any period of time, even if, even you know being educated, there's still miscellaneous things that happen. You get surprised. Nothing is exact. True investors understand that investing brings risk. But those that are just starting to be a passive investor in multifamily, when things go wrong, they're like, but well, you're supposed to know everything. It's like, no, it's an, that's why the private placement memorandum says real estate investing is risky. You could lose all, some or all of your money, which very rarely happens, but, this, but stressful times happen often if you're, not, if you're not buying right and you don't get into a rhythm. It always happens at the beginning, too. It's not like you, know, you, start, you start doing your deals and you start understanding the rhythm of deals and how deals should go, but it's the beginning when you don't know what you don't know. Oh, peeling back the onion is crazy, right? What's that? When you peel back the onion, you know what I mean? You start to reveal things like, oh, no way. Oh, oh, this tenant base. Now we got to do a tenant reposition. That was the bad one. That's the worst thing in the world. 
Yeah, yeah, repositioning the entire tenant base. Yeah. yeah. Well, I want to thank you for coming on to this call. I'm going to, on Thursday, I'm going to be driving back up from um, uh, the Cape. I'm going to give you a buzz. We can catch up. I haven't talked to you in a while. Yeah, I need to catch up with you. I wanted to talk to you about one deal that I said I'm having a little bit of issue with. I wanted to see what your thoughts were. All right. Sounds good. So uh, for everybody else that's out there, you know, you, you always have two homeworks. So that is go out there and put you, get two offers in. There don't have to be deals at work. Just, you know, just go through the process, go on LootNet, go on Kretzky, go on those websites and um, you know, talk to the brokers. That's all you're looking to do is establish a broker relationship and then get yourself into two networking situations. These days, it's virtual meetups. And you can certainly raise funds doing virtual meetups as well. Um, there's little technique to it, but uh, you can do it. And then there's small social situations that you can get involved in as well. So that's it. Thanks everybody for joining us and we'll see you next time next week. Bye everybody. You've been listening to the Multifamily Deal Lab podcast, where the deals get done. If you'd like to learn more, visit davesfreebook.com. And don't forget to leave a five-star rating and review and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. Thanks for listening.